Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the first in the series of Teaching Reading Comprehension with Dr. Janelle Wills. For those of you who aren't familiar with Hawker Brown, though, since 1985, we have empowered F to 12 teachers and educational professionals with the tools and skills such as these webinars to improve classroom and raise student achievement. My name is Thea Dupay, and I'm the Managing Director of Professional Services at Hawker Brown Education, based in Melbourne. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Janelle Wills, who is the professional, who's the Director of Professional Learning at Hawker Brownlow Education and works extensively with educators, school systems and regions to implement research-based strategies know to impact student achievement. She is the Lead Training Associate in Australia and New Zealand for High Reliability Schools, the New Art and Science of Teaching and other Mazzano research topics. Janelle has authored and co-authored num numerous books and articles, including Thinking Protocols for Learning, published this year. Janelle's PhD thesis focused on gifted students with reading difficulties. It contributed to multiple fields of knowledge, including special education, gifted education, assessment and feedback. With that, I'll pass you over to Janelle. Thanks, Janelle. Just had to make sure I was unmuted then. Thank you, Thea, very much. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining me and taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to uh, spend roughly 60 minutes or so um, looking at something that's in incredibly important, looking at uh, reading comprehension. This session, uh, which is in part of a series of three, as you know, um, um, and so, but we're going to look at the research, but then we're also going to look at some very practical strategies because I know, um, in a, you know, in, in a busy time at the at the moment, you really want to have some of those takeaways. So, in this one, um, there'll be roughly six strategies I'll share with you this morning. In the second session, there'll be a, a lot more because we'll have already gone back through some of the research and things already. Just in terms of setting up for this morning and for this series, I just wanted to take a little bit of a, a trip down memory lane and look back in time just a little bit in terms of the teaching of reading and the teaching of reading comprehension. And um, way, way back, pre-20th century, it was really quite interesting because the focus then was very much um, on uh, no, my microphone's not mute, so I'm not sure what's happening there. I might get there to, to sort out some of those issues with the, with the sound. Um, so the focus was in on oral reading, and this was predominantly because when you think back in those times, um, very few people actually could read. So um, it would just be maybe one person in the family, and and the, the focus was on reading out loud because sometimes reading was for actual entertainment or to share information uh, to to everyone. From there, we we from the 19th, 1900s to the 1970s, it, it became more of a thing of, okay, it's not so much about how reading sounded and reading out loud, uh, but were we understanding what was being read? And, and this changed greatly again because we had the education revolution where um, or, and, uh, where everyone started to um, uh, go to school. So a lot more people knew how to read. So the focus wasn't so much on reading out loud, but then reading to ourselves. And, and a real emphasis became on this thing of, of um, understanding the text. Interestingly enough, though, um, uh, it, it was very much that just you had to understand the correct meaning of the text. So what we saw was a lot of sort of systems where children or, or students would be asked to read a passage of text and then they would be given comprehension questions to answer um, afterwards and, and you know, it, then there was an indication of whether they were correct or, or in, incorrect. It was very much, and this is really dating me, but it was very much the way that I was taught to read. And we had a system of, I don't know whether you, any of you are familiar with it, but SRA cards. And we literally just, you know, had these um, little cards that we read and we answered the questions and we looked to see if we were right. And then if we were, um, depending on how we were going, we went up another level. Now, that type of um, approach is still present today. So it, it's not necessarily um, 
just 1970s or, or 60s thing. Now, from there, we then moved on to starting to look at, well, hang on, having the, the reader um, much more involved in this process. So it wasn't just that um, my interpret, uh, the, the, you know, whether or not I got the correct interpretation of that text, but very much the, this notion of um, we, we can all read a particular text and get different meaning from it. So this change was um, what they actually called the cognitive revolution, starting to, to really think about how the reader themselves constructs the meaning and, um, and that that text is open to interpretation. It gave way to um, a lot of um, uh, inquiry um, and research. Um, so they started to look at things like um, knowledge structures and very much this notion of prior knowledge and how that's stored in the brain, but then how that's activated in the reading process and how I use that prior knowledge to help me gain meaning from the text. They also started to look at how text structures actually influence um, my understanding and, and that if I'm aware and know text structures, that helps me to, um, to understand a text um, more effectively. So this is where they would really focus in on signal words, for example. So if I was reading, um, I would be looking at words that would would signal cause and effect and, and relationships and, and so that would help me to, to gain meaning. They also started to look at the really important aspect of the actual comprehension strategies themselves and um, uh, how, how they're used and, and the particular strategies that are used for making meaning. And then of course they started to look at what particular strategies and techniques um, had the greatest impact. And that was where we ended up with things like reciprocal teaching coming into play and a lot of the research that was conducted at that time. Move on past the 1990s and of course we have the reading wars and um, those, those reading wars just, you know, sort of bubble up uh, constantly. And it's always this, the, the debate around whether uh, the, import, the importance it's put on phonics or, um, or comprehension. Um, in the phonics world, um, and, and you know, it's very important in terms of decoding, but it was that decoding was important and that comprehension just sort of came along as a byproduct of, of that, of decoding. Whereas in whole language, they built on all of what I was just describing previously from the cognitive revolution. So very much, again, um, uh, that uh, it, it's reader is builder, um, that we build and we create the meaning, but also that we're very, we're getting our students to be very metacognitively aware that when they've lost meaning, they also know where to fix that. So that's very much part of um, whole language as well. But then they added uh, another piece into it where they said context was important. So the context in which I'm reading a text will impact on how I understand it on my comprehension of that text. And when you think about it, um, like you can read, uh, like think of a text that you may have read at one point and you get a particular meaning from that. And then another time, because you know more or you've got more background information or you've had different uh, experiences, something's happened, you then get a different meaning or different, you, you notice things in that text that you hadn't noticed before. In a whole language, they also incorporate, they incorporated literature. So they start to talk about that when we're teaching reading, how important it is to have what we call rich text. So some of those beautiful, you know, even picture books that can be um, used so well for the teaching of comprehension. And then of course, a big one in whole language is also the incorporation of critical literacy. Now I'm just gonna stop there for one second because I've just, given you a whole bunch of information there. Just think about your own experience in terms of learning to read. What approach do you think was taken when you were learning to read? Was it like me where you had, you know, those uh, comprehension tasks, you know, the passage that you read and then the questions? Was it whole language? What was it? And if you don't mind, please just pop it into the chat channel. Which, which approach do you think 
you were exposed to. We'll just quickly wait for people to add, add a few. Ah, Stacy, you had SRA cards as well. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, if, oh, quite a few. Look at that. Lots of people with SRA cards. Ah, yeah, thrash sometimes, um, very much in terms of the decoding, whole language. Lots of SRA cards, wow. Yes, yeah. Uh, when I first started to teach, actually, that was, um, uh, whole language was really coming in, in there. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for adding... Well, I can't believe how many SRA cards there are. Oh, and a bit of the speed reading, yeah. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Now I'm getting a bit of an idea of... <laughs> Lynette, yes, Lynette just said, so we were very old. Yes, oh, Claire, you are going to love... Um, a, a lot of what I'm going to share with you is is from... Um, Stephanie and, and Anne Goodverse. I'm, I'm such a, a fan of, of their work. The other thing I'm going to introduce you to is, um, because as Thea said, my background, uh, some of the work that I do now is around the new art and science of teaching. And um, I'm going to share a little bit that, um, yeah, Sonia just made the comment, and this is fabulous actually. If you can see there in the chat, she said lots of things that supposedly assessed comprehension but didn't teach it and that that's very that was one of the criticisms of that time uh, absolutely that that we weren't actually teaching it we were simply uh, assessing um, but one of the things that when we start to look at you know the the best method and this is more to the point when we um, are looking at phonics versus whole language I love this quote that is taken straight from the New Art and Science of Teaching Reading. Um, and I'm not going to read it because you're all very proficient readers. I'll leave you to just read that quote. So very much a diagnostic approach here and saying, well, you know, it, it's, there's not a one size fits all. It depends on what our students are bringing to the table. Um, uh, and, and, you know, for some of the students, uh, Thea mentioned my uh, PhD, which was gifted students with reading difficulties. A lot of those students actually had um, fundamental uh, difficulties with um, phonological awareness, but incredibly high levels of comprehension um, and, and extraordinary uh, vocab. So it, it was, we needed to really build on their strengths, which was their ability to, to infer and, and work at high levels of comprehension. I'm going to show you this uh, model. I really love this. It actually comes, as you see, from uh, Julia Sims and Robert Mazzano, and it's straight out of um, the, the Art and Science of Teaching Reading. But I think this really helps us just as a great visual in terms of how uh, reading skills are developed. And you'll notice here that they have the foundational skills, so concepts of print. Uh, those of you not from a primary background, they're things like, you know, do the students actually know the direction of text and um, the, the, even the front and the back of the book and all those kinds of things. And tier one vocab, that's very much just, you know, the, the basic vocab that we hear and we're exposed to. But over on the other side, you know, so built on that, there's obviously word recognition, which is where all of our um, phonological awareness development is coming in. All of the um, things there that you see in terms of pre-alphabetic, partial alphabetic, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there. Um, we then move on to looking at fluency and prosody. prosody. I'm going to talk about that. Vocab um, and comprehension. And you'll notice different types of comprehension there. So we have listening comprehension, reading comprehension, and then what they call disciplinary comprehension. So it's my comprehension that grows and improves as I'm getting more skilled and knowledgeable in a particular subject area. Now you notice that we've got different, or they have different uh, color coding there. It's actually because of, for this reason here, um, they're saying that some skills are constrained. So if I come back to this one, you'll notice that we have the um, 
the boxes completely full and the the um, black boxes. So you're, what that means is that things such as fluency and word recognition tend to develop in a fairly linear way and they're developed in a relatively short period of time and so they're constrained. The other ones such as vocabulary and comprehension tend to develop, develop organically and over long periods of time and as you see there they have unlimited growth and um, so when we have a look back here reading comprehension disciplinary comprehension tier, um, tier two and tier three vocab so that's very much your cognitive verbs your academic vocab unlimited uh, growth and, and in terms of reading discipline uh, comprehension and disciplinary comprehension as well. Notice that listening comprehension sits here as constrained and basically listening comprehension precedes reading comprehension. I can often, um, I can be operating at high levels of comprehension just from listening to the text, but that only helps me in terms of my comprehension so far. So that's why it's left as constrained. Now, if you're like me, and some of you may have heard this term before, I had never, ever, ever heard that term prosody before. And all that actually means is it's the extent to which oral reading sounds like oral speech. So it's the way I put stress on my syllables, um, intonation and the pace of reading. Um, and it, it's basically built up of word recognition and then that uh, ability to um, to put the correct uh, intonation and things like that, the correct pace, which then leads to fluency. Um, and this is really important in terms of comprehension, in terms of freeing up working memory and and cognitive load. So I can actually attend to the um, uh, to the meaning of the text. D just try this out, just as a um, a notion of how important that word recognition becomes and how strong that becomes. This is the Stroop effect, named after the gentleman who, who came up with this, but sort of showing that once we know a word, it's very hard to ignore that word once we recognize it. So the Stroop effect, if you just take a look at the screen and what you have to try to do is say the color not the word. So in that first one, the, although the word says yellow, I've got to try and think of it as green. So you see how you go. See if your word, how word, how strong your word recognition is. See if you can, if you can manage it. Off you go. How'd you go? It's quite difficult, isn't it? Um, but as I said, you know, that, that rapid word recognition um, is very important in terms of freeing up the mental resources for thinking about the writer's intent and, and so very much, um, uh, you know, an important aspect of, of what we're doing. And yeah, I agree, Fiona, it is really tricky. Now, an important thing for this session and, and uh, the other sessions as well is now you know why I chose to um, focus one of the sessions on, on uh, vocabulary development. But this is an important consideration. Look at this. After year three, most students can decode on average 25 to 30% more words than they can actually, than they understand. So it's where we often talk about, and, and many of you are, are joining me right now, I'm sure you're aware of, of this quote, where we would talk about that so often our students bark at print, but they have no understanding of what that actually means. Um, and it's where, if you're joining me and you're, you're coming from a, a, a secondary context, it's where often we, we can be misguided in thinking that the students are understanding what they're reading because they seem like to be fluent readers, proficient readers, and yet you ask them about what they've just read and they'll look at you as if, what? I've got no idea. So as I said, we, in these sessions, we are going to focus in more on, um, on the comprehension side of things. Now, what's an interesting thing, and my daughter did this recently, just to get a bit of an idea of, um, uh, 
how have students perceived reading? And, and I guess it gives you a little bit of a, a sense of even the, the approach to the teaching of reading they may have been exposed to, whether it was very much phonics or whether there was ex more exposure to the explicit teaching of comprehension strategies as well. But just to test this out even, check with, um, uh, with your students, you know, what is reading? And it's interesting, you know, so many kids will come out, as you see here, figuring out the words, so knowing the letters. So it's all just about the text, but not what they're doing. Um, again, it's breaking down words, figuring out words. Here we get a little bit closer to that and what it means. And this one was what um, one of uh, my daughter's students said, it's a way to learn. But what we really want our students thinking about in terms of reading is that reading is thinking. And there we've got that lovely quote from um, Stephanie Harvey and, and Anne Goodvis. But that reading is thinking. Um, you know, a teacher uh, was telling us, telling that um, she actually asked one of her students who was reading, oh, what are you thinking? And the student actually said, I'm not thinking, I'm reading. <laughs> ah. So when we're in, in this work, um, in these sessions, I'm really drawing heavily on, on, um, on, on Stephanie and Anne's work because I'm such a fan of, of uh, their approach. But when we talk about strategic reading, um, what we're talking about is readers think not only about what they are reading, but what they are learning um, in, in that same process. And so we get this lovely cycle that as I'm looking at the information or the knowledge, I'm activating my prior knowledge to comprehend. I'm building on knowledge to gain further, further knowledge. Um, and that's where reading itself can actually change and uh, impact on, on thinking as well. So when we start to look at this work, we're really looking not just at the teaching of comprehension strategies for the sake of teaching comprehension strategies. We're really seeing them as a means to an end, not an end in themselves, because it's all very much around meaning making. And of course, again, we've got that um, strong metacognitive aspect coming in here. And in the next session, I'm going to talk a lot more about the development of, of metacognitive skills. But reading and, and then therefore the, the importance of comprehension strategies, it's very much a goal-oriented process um, because I'm, I'm wanting, my goal is to understand that text. So I need to be constantly metacognitively aware of how am I going, is this, am I understanding it, does it make sense, um, what connections am I making and so forth. So forth. So it, it's very much an active process rather than just passively reading those those um, those passages and then answering the questions like so many as many of us did. One of the um, I guess grandfathers of this work or, or godfathers um, is is Pearson and Pearson looked to see well what are those comprehension strategies that really effective readers use. Um, number one is, is just what I was talking about, the monitoring of comprehension. And the other one, the constantly activating, connecting to background knowledge, asking questions. Um, you know, why would you do this? Does that make sense? Why would that character do this? Why has the author um, positioned the reader in this way? Um, they Effective readers infer, they visualise the meaning, they determine importance and then obviously are able to summarise and synthesise. Over the next um, uh, part of this session, I'm going to delve into specific strategies around each of those and, and continue on, on to the next session as well. One of the things, the points that Pearson makes, which I think is really important even as we um, first start to delve in here in terms of uh, comprehension development, he actually says how important it is to develop a common language um, in, in terms of terms. Uh, so whether you're teaching in a primary setting or a secondary setting, that we have similar language. So even when we're talking about background knowledge, are we going to use the term background knowledge? Or are we going to use the term prior knowledge? Or are we going to use the word schema? 
or in one of the schools I was working, even in prep, the students were able to recognise that schema was background knowledge and they, were, they used those terms interchangeably. But it's almost, it, it's language that we need to teach. Now in terms of the most um, effective uh, comprehension uh, instruction, it is explicit um, in instruction. Um, no right or wrong order in terms of the introduction of the strategies. Um, it, it's best that there's a flexible approach, but hands down in all of the research, as you see there, the, uh, everyone agrees that the, pretty much the, the best um, model is the gradual release of responsibility um, model. So very much around lots of teacher modelling, um, a lot of um, co-construction, a lot of working together, a lot of dialogue in this approach and a lot of the strategies I'm going to share with you um, in the next little bit are, are very much around um, you know, students talking about text together um, and then working um, through to working independently. Now again, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a break because again, I've just sort of hit you with, with a lot of information. Just a, a quick sort of, you know, 50 seconds or so it will be now. This is a comprehension strategy, which I'll just stop that for one sec. This is a comprehension strategy that actually does come from visible thinking. Uh, I'm such a fan of, um, of that work from um, oh gosh, isn't this terrible? Off the top of my head now, I can't think of where they're from. Um, I'll, I'll put a link up for you. Uh, but Visible Thinking has, has fantastic um, resources there. This one I use quite often. No, it's not Hattie, it's um, uh, Rick Hart. Um, I've actually got his book right here. Uh, there we go. Upside down. Can you see? Making vis so Ron, Ron Ricard and the, the Project Zero people. But Connect, connect um, and Extend, which is what I'm doing here, um, I've adapted from their strategy, which is Connect, Extend and Challenge. Um, so I'm just going to ask you this time to connect and extend. How does what you're hearing connect with what you already know and do? But what has extended your thinking a little bit? Um, if we were adding in the challenge, it would be what has challenged your thinking. So I'm going to start that clock again. I'll pop out of the way and just give you a little bit of time to, to reflect and use that strategy. Okay, I'm going to jump back in there again. I believe, um, oh awesome, thank you everyone for, it's great, I love when people actually do use the chat channel. Um, yeah, that, that gradual release of responsibility model is so, um, so important. The other one thing I would uh, look at, and we can look at this a little bit more as well, is um, uh, next time is, is how um, useful that reciprocal teaching approach is. And, and in fact, um, more recently even how, it, or not more recently, but how it can also be used if you're teaching um, mathematics and, and students um, uh, to, to problem solve. There's some, some really great work that came out of uh, QUT. Now let's just jump into a couple of strategies. I'm just looking here at my at my timing just to make sure that um, we're on schedule and yes we are. Oh, it's, it, the, I love the point that's just been made there in the chat box about the importance of the modelling. I cannot emphasise 
too much how important that modeling is and I'll talk about that a lot even when we start to talk about the development of metacognitive uh, skills and behavior teacher modeling is incredibly incredibly important <laughs> great I'm looking I'm going to look forward to reading all those chats later now one uh, I, I loved this um, yeah, I will, Lynette, I'll do that in the second, in that second session. I'll, I'll put that on notice. Um, I love this from uh, Stephanie, actually it comes from, um, uh, in, in terms of students interacting with text and comprehending, they actually talk about, and this is so much I, I suppose for, for, uh, for those of you in a secondary context or even upper primary, but just the dangers of the highlighter and beware of the highlighter if we're getting students to really interact with text and, and make meaning. I saw this and I, I had to laugh, but you know, so often, you know, when you say to students, oh, highlight the important part, you know, so it's like almost they get a paintbrush out and, and it's just sort of highlighting everything. At least with this uh, visual that I've used, at least hopefully they've got some sort of coding system there in the way that they've, uh, they've highlighted. But this was some advice uh, from Harvard University. I will read this one. Throw away the highlighter in favor of a pen or pencil. Highlighting can actually distract from the business of learning and dilute your comprehension. It only seems like an active reading strategy. In actual fact, it can lull you into a dangerous passivity. And um, what they've suggested is, you know, first, if we mark, if we actually write on the book and encourage our students to do so, or not even on the book, but on whatever the text is, um, uh, keeps them awake. Um, and there again, we've got reading, if it is active, is thinking, thinking tends to express itself in words. The person who says he knows what he thinks, but cannot express it really does not know what he thinks. And the third one is writing your reactions down helps you to remember the thoughts of the author. And I go back now and, and you know, obviously all of us online here are very proficient readers. Um, but I know I go back over some of my texts and, you know, I, I can track even how I was like, um, what was in my thought process or what was important for me at the time because of the connections and what I had written down. So Stephanie and Anne Guvers actually talk about this notion of getting kids to leave tracks of their thinking. What I love about this as well is that this also becomes a, um, a piece of formative assessment because I'm, I'm starting to to delve in and, and see how kids are, what they're thinking, do they have misconceptions and, and so on and so forth. So all of these sorts of things, if, you know, getting them to underline, um, putting numbers in the margin, circling keywords. Um, they actually, I really love this. Um, you wouldn't have to use this same coding system, but I think this is, is quite nice. Um, but where they've, they've actually put the like created symbols and I think this would be a great one to do with your students actually co-create um, the, the coding system that might they might use and and even just introduce these over time but as you see there you know an R this reminds me of um, so that notion of, of building in that prior knowledge making connections um, a text to text connection we've got the T to T L for new learning and uh, and as you can see there um, from a practical perspective, because obviously it's not always um, possible to, to actually write on the text itself, um, but a lot of schools I've worked in will use sticky notes. Um, uh, and, and what's quite nice that I've seen, it was a lovely um, example where the, this was a book that was going to be read by you know, different groups and different people. And the, the, the students were actually encouraged to leave their sticky notes there, um, and particularly their questions that they were asking. Um, and, and what was lovely was uh, other students started to, to then uh, uh, add to those annotations. So it's quite a, quite a nice strategy. This one's incredibly simple. Again, this is just sort of getting, um, uh, students to uh, to dialogue to have conversations about the connections that they're making you 
these strategies are, are sort of incorporating all of those um, comprehension strategies I mentioned previously. Um, but say something is basically just again, um, and again, I'm mindful with this work with the new art and science of teaching, we often talk about the importance of chunking content. And I think we need to do this with um, comprehension as well. So rather than getting the students to read a full passage or a, a full page or whatever, but just break that down. It might just be one section, uh, it might be one paragraph, but then at that designated spot, with their partner, they have to say something, um, a key point or a personal connection. Um, now, I'm also a fan of Kylene Beers. Um, now, Kylene, and I'll explain a little bit more about her book in just a moment, but Kylene adds to that strategy of, of say something from a reading perspective, which I love, and she puts rules around it so that when you say something, you have to do one of the following. So as you see there on the screen, they either have to make a prediction, ask a question, clarify something, make a comment, make a connection. And most importantly is this one. If you can't do one of those things, you need to go back and reread. So always emphasizing that this is about meaning making. Um, and so if I can't make, ask a question or, or a comment or a connection, I've, I've got to go back and check in again. Now, just to give you a little bit of um, background on Kylie and Beers, as you see, I love the title there, When Kids Can't Read What Teachers Can Do. Now, Kylie, um, as you see there, it's a guide for teachers from six years, six to 12. So she was actually teaching in a secondary context and, you know, discovered she was, she was going out to be an English teacher, all excited about the prospect of teaching students about Shakespeare and all the rest of it. And um, uh, um, uh, sorry that Lisa has to leave. She's, her connection isn't stable enough. Um, so she, she discovered so many of her students couldn't read. So these are all of the strategies that she actually employed from a secondary perspective, but I draw upon them for both primary and secondary. So I can highly recommend that, that particular text. Now, one of the things that we know in terms of reading difficulties is that quite often um, the, the difficulties are actually prior knowledge difficulties. Um, and and, and uh, prior knowledge, particularly, it can be around vocab. So this whole thing about building background knowledge um, with our students is, is incredibly important. And one of the strategies I love for this, which is so very simple, is called word splash. Now, all you do with this one is choose a piece of text and just grab out key words from it. Um, and as you see here, I've, I've got a text. Um, I'll show you that in a moment. But these are some key words from the text and I've just splashed them up on, on, the, on the screen. It can be words or it can be phrases. For younger students, sometimes I use pictures as well. But the idea is from those words, the idea is to predict what you think the text that I'm going to share with you is about. Now, if, if, if we were in a classroom setting, I'd obviously be getting you to do this in a group and getting you to work together. Even this is a wonderful opportunity to introduce some of the words for well, what does simultaneously actually mean. Um, so anyway, I'll stop, give you a chance. What do you think, based on the words that you're seeing there on the screen, what do you think this text that I'm about to show you is about? Yeah, so we've got differentiated teaching, yes. Differentiation, yeah, could be. All right, let's have a look. This, uh, um, yes, different ways students learn, yeah. I think uh, many of you will actually relate to this. Uh, it, um, I've mentioned my daughter already, uh, but Hannah actually, it, well, obviously she's a teacher and she sent this one to me. No, having trouble. There we go. Edu juggle. Um, so many of you probably today will go and edu juggle, and I'll leave you to read it. It's 
So yeah, we edgy juggle all day long, but yes, it is rewarding. Now, why I love that strategy is because of that opportunity to, um, <laughs> yes, Sandra, every day. Um, um, it, it's that opportunity to foreground um, some of the language. I actually find that when I use this with students, it, it's a really good engagement strategy actually because what happens as they're making their predictions and, and I would typically even get them to write those down, um, but then when they go to read the actual text, you see them doing things like, yes, we got that, yes, that was it, we, we were on, on the money. And, and so they're reading the text um, uh, in a much more engaged and active way. Now, another one, another version of that just checking the time to make sure I've... Um, another version of that comes from Kylene Beers and she calls it a text party. Actually, I think she calls it a tea party, but I changed it to a text party. Similar notion uh, in that you've got uh, keywords, but um, the difference this time is Kylene says take out key phrases. Now if you've got 25 students in your class roughly and um, you would choose, let, let's, let's make it an even number 24, uh, you would choose 12 keywords or, or phrases and just have those um, uh, you know, printed out on, on uh, strips of paper and you do, you double them so you print them twice. Um, cut them up and you distribute those strips to each child in the, or each student in the class. The idea is that um, they don't talk about what they have on their strip of paper with the people at their group. They, um, first of all, stand up and they, they walk around the classroom and they share with as many different people as they can. So each person reads their strip of paper and then with the um, person they're talking with, they look at that strip of paper and work out how the phrases might be connected. Then they move on and talk to somebody else and then they've got another piece of text that they're incorporating. So get the idea, each time they talk to somebody new, they're getting another piece of text that they're building on and, and trying to make those connections of how, uh, and, and to build up a, a sense of what the text is going to be about. At you know, a given amount of time, you get them all to come back to their original group of four possibly, and then they discuss what they'd heard and what what they're thinking now this text could be about. So as a group then, they create a group prediction of what that passage will be. Again, it's a great opportunity um, for um, building up that background knowledge, foregrounding the language, uh, I shared that strategy with a, with a secondary teacher and he was saying um, that he was going to use it when he was introducing um, Shakespearean plays just to give the students a bit of exposure to some of that, that language and the phrases. So a lot of, it, one, of one of my absolute favourite strategies, that one, the Tea Party. Now these are, um, uh, these are, have been around forever. Um, but the anticipation guides are wonderful as well for um, just activating that prior knowledge, but also getting the students then to think about how their thinking may have, may have changed after they've read the piece of text. So as you can see there, this comes from readwritethink.org. They have fantastic literacy uh, resources up there that are cross curricular and whether you're primary or secondary you'll find just so many awesome um, strategies there including uh, the anticipation guide like this one. So all you do is simply write statements, the students think about whether they strongly agree or disagree with that statement and then most importantly give that explanation. Now again I love this from a formative assessment perspective because I can start to look at what are their misconceptions and so on and so forth. Um, and then most importantly then, after um, reading or discussing or whatever, that they go back and look at are their uh, responses going to change. This, if I was doing this um, in a written format, I would get them to, to uh, change the 
color of their pens when they're doing that one. Another one that um, I use a lot and absolutely love, this is more in terms of getting students to dig deeper into a text and determine importance. It's called sentence, sentences, phrases and words and help students, as you see here, to collaboratively, collaboratively construct meaning to clarify and extend their thinking. Now, it sounds like I'm the queen of sticky notes. I do, I use them a lot. But the idea is um, to, from the text that they've read, to choose one sentence that stands out for them, to choose one phrase, so we, and then finally to choose one word that is um, significant for them. And what in their group of four or group of three or whatever, um, they each share what that sentence is and why, the phrase that they've chosen and why, and then the word that they've chosen and why. And then through that group discussion, they can start to talk about how are their responses similar? How are their responses different? Um, why could there be differences between what group members have considered as important or significant, which is sort of coming back to, you know, the prior knowledge piece as well. Um, what is the uh, relationship between sentence phrases and words that have been selected? And then what personal connections have been made between what you read or heard and your own experiences? Now, obviously, again, from a practical perspective, um, we're going to be looking, you're not going to hit them with all of those questions. Um, uh, you might build those up over, over time. Now, just one final one, as we get ready to finish and then we'll, I'll stop for questions. Uh, but this is another one that I wanted to just quickly show you. And this one's the questioning piece. Because um, we talked about how important it is for students to to question, but my experience has been students actually really struggle to formulate questions. Um, and in fact, because I suppose it's us as teachers who are usually asking the questions, right? Um, when I actually ask a student, um, what question would you have about what you've just read? The student just looked at me as if to say, what, are you mad? Why would I have a question? You're the one who's meant to have the questions. So I found this um, simple strategy as an easy way to help students to create questions. Um, sort of like a, a bit of a game sort of thing. Um, but the idea is just simply to have sets of cards um, created. And you'll see set one, which is where we've got what, who, where, why, which and how. And then on the other set, did, can, would. In their group, they basically, each student chooses one card from set one, one card from set two. So I might end up with what did, or I might end up with what, uh, who might, or why, why might. You get the idea, where can. And the idea is using those two, um, two cards or, or those, that, that beginning, that stem, I then have to create my question. Um, so great in terms of um, formulating questions. Um, you can see there, you know, it, it could be that they've watched something, um, but if they've read something. What I like to do then is actually have the kids um, create those questions in their group, but then um, swap the groups or swap the sets of questions. So uh, group A may then be um, answering the questions that were developed by group B. Um, so that's just uh, another very quick, simple one that I have found really useful, love to use. And on that note, Oh boy, um, we're always meant to leave about 10 minutes for questions. So I'm going to stop there and give you an opportunity to ask any questions. I think uh, Saya will join us, jump back in. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have a look and see if there are any questions. I have got one um, here at the moment. Um, I've got a question. Oh, hang on. 
Oh, um, are we able to get a list of text refers in the slideshow? Yep, Victoria, we can sort that out for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that notion, Lisa, of a chatterbox. Um, that would be great as well with those questions. Um, the list of texts, we can send that through absolutely. Define reciprocal reading. Yeah, what I'll do is um, I noticed that one. I'll put that one on hold because um, that will, will take a little while and I'd like to go into depth with that one um, and, and look at it in terms of mathematics and different things as well. Um, so I'll do that one in session two, which is um, coming up on October 22nd. I think that's correct. Um, is there a correct order for teaching the strategies? No, the research does sort of indicate that um, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, the, the research sort of says, you know, there's, there's not um, one, one set um, uh, order. Although for me, it sort of makes sense for me that we'd start with um, uh, uh, that connecting to prior knowledge because so many of the other strategies then flow on from there. Um, uh, so, so yeah, that I, I would I would say that's the that's the order. But the main thing is that students can use them flexibly so that they know to move in and out of those, um, and that they're more cognizant actually of when to use different strategies and, and actually thinking metacognitively around is this the right strategy to use at this time or is that going to get in my way? That's sort of the important thing. I'll talk a lot more about that as well next time when we're talking about um, the metacognition. I just noticed there was one coming up there and I'll, I'll take all of this um, uh, on board ready for next time. Um, uh, um, some stuff around uh, gifted kids uh, with with dyslexia because um, indeed my daughter who I mentioned before and she's going to hate me if she knows I've <laughs> talked about her so many times uh, but Hannah actually um, identifies as, as being um, dyslexic we, we didn't actually use that term with her uh, but she's also in that gifted range so and she's a prolific reader and um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that next time we 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 meet so, um, Lorraine here, Janelle. it says and mm -hmm. um, what are the two teaching vocab types oh the in terms of the tiers was that in terms of tier two and tier three mm -hmm. might have been Yes, Maybe. okay, Lorraine. Yeah, so t I, I just glossed over that very quickly. Um, I'll go into that in a lot more detail in the third session. But tier two words tend to be your cognitive verbs, things like, you know, analyze, evaluate. And then tier three words are your subject specific terms, um, words that you need for, ac we call them academic vocab words. So in science, it could be experiment. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and technical words of that nature. So, yeah, I think if, how are we going for time? Oh, we're still okay at the minute. I'm just seeing if there's any more yeah, um, checking. questions. It's lovely to see um, so many people talking about how what I've spoken about has really validated what they're doing in the classroom. Um, and, and that, that's a wonderful thing, Anna actually has said that, because uh, there's often a danger, I think, sometimes for us to get onto things like this. And, and I know I've done it myself. I'll go, oh, wow, well, you know, I already knew that or, or whatever. Um, but I think it, it, it's good to hear it again. Um, and I think it, it's wonderful to be reassured, reassured and to be affirmed. And, and I think when, and, and sometimes some of these things are simply reminders where we go, oh yeah, I used to do that. I need to go back and just do it a lot more. So um, yeah, thank you. The next, I've got the next. So the next session is session two on October 22. I know that Thayer is going to email everybody. Um, and we've, we've got the, um, uh, the recording will be available. I know people were asking about um, um, 
availability of, of seeing that again. Uh, that's also my email there if there's anything in between now and then that you kind of go, oh gee, can you include you know, this in the next session as well. So um, it's janelle.wills at hbe.com.au. But one last question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. She says, do you know how many SS teachers using this cross-curricula, i.e. in science, etc.? How many, which teachers? She said SS teachers. SS. Um, oh, secondary school teachers. Um, uh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I had to work out that code. Um, oh, look, I'm not sure. Um, I, I have worked... Um, that we, we've done some sessions with secondary school teachers um, in, in various schools, I know, um, uh, and we've been using, talking about using those um, from a cross-curricular perspective. And definitely um, with secondary teachers and with the cross-curricular, it, it's really useful to look at the literacy continuum from um, ACARA as well, um, because that sort of really emphasis, emphasizes the importance of using these. Um, I know we do a lot of work on academic vocab with secondary school teachers. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't tell you the whole, whole um, the, the numbers though. And it's great to see Victoria, a whole school literacy program, that's wonderful. Well, folks, I know you've got busy days and um, some people have already started to, to, to head off. So thank you once again so much for, for joining me, for spending your time with me and have a wonderful day. Hopefully I will see you um, next session. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.